Some drivers try to keep their revs low to save fuel, and in their experience, they're not wrong. It saves them fuel. Also, manufacturers understand this as well, which is why they program automatic gearboxes to change up gears super early, keeping those revs as low as possible. And in my experience, if I drive with low revs, I save fuel too. I even did an experiment and made a video all about it. I'll leave a link to that up there. The question is though, does driving with low revs cause engine damage? To help you understand, firstly, I need to give you an idea of how a four-stroke engine works. Don't worry, this is not gonna be long or complicated. Most cars on the road use four-stroke cycle engines, most petrol and diesel cars anyway. This is a fluid extractor, it's used to pull fluid out of places or you can use it to put fluid in other places. Don't think it's for your doctor, it's a bit big. Ah! I think that one will hurt. But anyway, the way the four stroke engine works, you have a piston in a cylinder and some valves at the top. The valve at the top opens, this is your first stroke of the four strokes, the piston goes down and draws in air and fuel at the top. That valve now closes. Your second stroke, your compression stroke, that fuel and air mixture gets compressed. Now, I'm not strong enough to compress it, so I am gonna let the fuel and air mixture, pretend fuel and air mixture out, and let's just pretend there is compressed fuel and air at the top of this cylinder now, and a spark plug, and that spark ignites. Bang, power, that's your power stroke, your third stroke. That's where the energy is created in the four stroke cycle. Then the exhaust valve at the top opens, and lets the exhaust out. That's your fourth stroke, the blow, the exhaust stroke. So in summary, you've got suck, squeeze, which I can't squeeze really, but let's pretend I've squeezed, bang, that's your power, and then blow the exhaust out. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, the four stroke cycle. And in a lot of cars, you have engines that have four of these in line, and there's always one providing the power stroke, whilst the other three are either doing their exhaust intake or compression because exhaust intake and compression does not create energy it actually saps some energy so it's good if you've always got one of the cylinders providing energy with that power stroke and how this up and down movement gets converted into rotational movement is pretty much the same way you ride a bicycle when you're on a bicycle you're pedaling your legs are going up and down but at the bottom at the crank your up and down movement of your legs is being converted into rotational movement. That's exactly what happens at the bottom of your engine at the crank. If you didn't understand that, don't worry. All you really need to know is that you've got pistons going up and down, which gets converted into a rotational movement at the crank. And if you're at low revs, your pistons are moving slowly and your crank is spinning slowly. But the intuitive thing to think is that if your pistons are moving slowly and your engine's spinning slowly, that's gonna cause less wear. Surely that's right? But no, that's not always the case. Whether or not you're putting your engine under stress from low revs depends on what level of load your engine is under. To understand what load is, imagine you're cycling and you're taking it easy. You're not trying to pedal quickly, but then you start going downhill. You decide though, I'm not gonna try and go any faster. I'm not gonna try and pedal quickly. I'm gonna pedal at the same rate as I was before. It suddenly becomes a lot easier for you to pedal. Now your legs are experiencing low load, but now you start going uphill and you want to try and pedal at the same rate. You don't wanna slow down. You're going to have to try really hard now to maintain that same rate of pedaling. Your legs are now experiencing high load and the engine experiences the exact same thing. To know whether or not your engine is experiencing high or low load, well, that depends on how hard you're pressing the gas pedal. If you're able to maintain low revs, but you only need to press the gas pedal very gently to do so, then your engine is under low load and you're not putting your engine under stress and it's incredibly unlikely that you're gonna be causing any harm to the engine. Long term, possibly, but I'll get to that later. But for short term, no. Your engine's going to be fine if it's a modern engine. If you're having to press the gas pedal really hard to maintain those low revs, now your engine is under high load and you are putting your engine under stress. However, with a modern engine, it's still very unlikely 
you're going to be causing any short-term harm, although it is more possible. So how does high load put a petrol engine under more strain? When the piston goes down, it draws in air and fuel. And if you're only pressing the gas pedal gently, it's gonna restrict how much air can get into here. The gas pedal is also known as the throttle pedal because it literally throttles down the engine and restricts how much air can get in the cylinder. So you can have below atmospheric pressure in here now, lower pressure. Whereas if you were to open the throttle completely and you do that by pressing the gas pedal as hard as you can, now when the piston goes down, you're gonna be drawing in close to atmospheric pressure in here. So higher pressure, much higher than before. And if your engine is turbocharged, you're gonna be forcing compressed air into here. So now the pressure inside this cylinder is gonna be higher than atmosphere. And then when you compress that already high pressure, which I can't do, so let's pretend I have, you're gonna have even higher pressure in here now. And then when the spark ignites and it combusts, even higher pressure. So high load puts your cylinder under more pressure, which puts your piston under more pressure. It puts these piston rings, these black rings here, which seal, seal the piston to the cylinder. They're under more pressure as well. It puts the bearing at the bottom of the connecting rod here on the crank under more pressure. If you make the pressure high enough, it's probably not gonna happen in a standard car, but maybe a modified car, you could even probably bend this connecting rod here. And the gasket here at the top, which connects the cylinder head to the block, that's under more pressure also. So if you press the gas pedal harder, you're putting your engine under more load. And if your engine is under more load, you're gonna have higher cylinder pressures, but you can press the gas pedal hard when you're at high revs. So you can have high cylinder pressures at high revs. In fact, your turbocharger may be producing more pressure at the higher revs and you may have even higher cylinder pressures at high revs as you would do at low revs. So why are people concerned about high cylinder pressures at low revs, but not so much at high revs? Well, one of the reasons is, is when you're at low revs, when the piston goes down and combustion happens, the combustion is taking place in a smaller area of the cylinder. So it's going to be under more strain. Whereas when your piston goes down quickly and combustion happens, combustion is happening over a greater area of the cylinder and therefore it's gonna put the engine under less strain. And something else to consider is when your engine is spinning slowly, your coolant pump and your oil pump is also likely spinning slowly. Now, yes, you can get variable oil pumps and you can have coolant pumps which are driven by an electric motor but let's say like most cars your coolant pump and your oil pump or most engines these days they're still pretty much connected to the engine and they go at the speed of the engine well the engine's spinning slowly meaning you're likely going to be generating less oil pressure and down here at the connecting rod bearing well, you want good oil pressure there to prevent metal on metal contact. Once you get metal on metal contact, it's gonna wear out very quickly. And when you have high cylinder pressures, there's higher pressure here as well. And when your coolant pump is spinning slowly, it's circulating the coolant around the engine more slowly, meaning it's less effective at keeping the engine cool, or whilst you're increasing cylinder pressures and therefore generating more heat. However, you probably don't need to worry about these things because they are old and they are solved. Engineers take these things into account when they are developing engines. They want the vehicle to last at least the warranty period without fault. They're not always successful, but that's the goal. So they are thinking about these things when they are designing the engine. If you have an older vehicle, then that may not be as true. Warranties from the 1980s, so cars sold in the 1980s, have a much shorter warranty than they did today. So they weren't engineering them to the same degree most of the time. And if you go back to the 1960s, it wasn't uncommon for an engine to need a full rebuild in the typical warranty period of a typical car sold today. So if you have a modern car, by modern I mean the last approximately 20 years, you probably don't need to worry about these things, although it's better not to be harsh towards your engine because it's not a guarantee. Some engines are better engineered than others. Some take these things more into account than others, so some are more reliable than others. However, 
if you modify your engine, well then you should be worried. It's true that most cars can produce way more power than they do from factory without the engine blowing up. You can go to somebody, they can give you more power, more torque. They can give you a lovely torque curve on that graph and you can drive it and think, wow, what an upgrade for not a huge amount of money. But what they can't do is what the manufacturer does. And that's because there's simply nowhere near enough money in it for them to do so. A manufacturer has a team of people. They test the vehicle in various parts of the world and often rack up hundreds of thousands of miles. They can get away with this because they're going to sell thousands of the product and they can split those costs over all those thousands. But when you have your car modified, what have you got to go by? Yes, it works great, but for how long? You can go on a Facebook group and try and find out. You can try and look at some forums online. You can ask people you know, but the information is going to be generally quite opinionated, often very different from person to person and limited really compared to the information that the manufacturer has had and the fact that they're providing a warranty because they have confidence in it. And how much more power can you increase before you have a problem? How much more power can you have before you have a problem? How long's a piece of string? Some engines take a big power hike and be fine, and some engines you give them a little power increase and then they fail. So if you modify your car, you're gonna to have to take greater care of it. You're gonna to have to worry about low speed pre-ignition when you're pressing the gas hard at low revs. How long can I stay near the red line for before something gets too hot? Do I need high octane fuel now instead of just, I like to use it, do I actually need it? Have I got enough oil pressure? Is my coolant system up to the job? If you've modified your car, you're going to have to worry about these things and take great care of it and hopefully it will be fine. If you've got a standard car, you can take far less care of it and it will probably be fine. But are there any long-term effects of using low revs when you're driving? Well, yes, there are. It can lead to oily deposits and carbon buildup in the intake of your engine and it can lead to problems with your exhaust emissions systems, particularly if you have a diesel. But the problem is, there's not a lot you can do about it because if you are having these issues, it's going to be down to the fact that you're driving in slow areas most of the time. And that's because of where you live, where you work, and where your friends live, where you happen to go. You don't get to choose that. It's much easier to change your car than where you work or where you live or even harder, where your friends live. So if you're predominantly driving slowly and your car suffers with this issue, you're going to have this issue regardless of whether or not you try to keep your revs a bit higher or you try to do a 20 minute motorway journey once a week or you even try to rev, red line the engine once a day. It's what you do predominantly with the car that counts. And if you're predominantly driving in slow areas and your car suffers with this issue, you're probably going to have this issue. So if you're having problems with your DPF or your EGR valve, or you're getting clogged up intake valves, then my recommendation is to look into the car that you're using, because if you continue to use that car in the same manner, you're probably going to continue to have those issues. A good example would be Toyota's D4S system because that has a fuel injector before the intake port and a direct fuel injector as well. So the fuel injector before the intake port keeps the intake port clear of oily deposits and carbon because of the fuel, it cleans it. So these systems don't suffer with that problem. Or an electric car, that may be the solution to your problems and you may really enjoy it. However, be careful before you recommend an electric car to someone who lives in an apartment without off-street charging, particularly if they do long journeys, because they probably won't appreciate it. There is an old saying, horses for courses. My recommendation is to listen to the engine. If it feels like it's struggling when you're trying to accelerate, then go to a lower gear. Don't make your engine struggle, it's not good for it. Also, use your gear shift indicator. If it's telling you a gear is better at a certain speed, then it knows that is the most fuel efficient gear and it shouldn't cause your engine any harm. The engineers should have thought about this. However, don't use it when you're accelerating or dealing with hazards and junctions. That's not when it's appropriate. It's appropriate if you're cruising along at a steady speed and you think, well, what's actually more efficient? Is fifth gear or sixth gear more efficient at this speed? It probably knows best. 
Having said that, your gear shift indicator is recommending a gear based on your current throttle position, along with your engine speed, your RPM, and the road speed. And it may recommend a higher gear, and you go to that higher gear, but then you accelerate. And now that higher gear is too high for the acceleration you require. Your gear shift indicator cannot see what's up ahead, and it doesn't know what you're about to do. So if it's recommending a higher gear and you know you're about to accelerate, then it's probably better not to go to that higher gear. Or if it does recommend a higher gear and you choose that gear and the engine starts to struggle, listen to that first. Don't make the engine struggle. If the engine is struggling, choose the lower gear to prevent it from struggling. Generally, they're pretty good, these systems, but some are better than others. The gear shift indicator should help you get the best fuel economy from your car, but you have to use it wisely. I'm about to contradict myself because I said, if you have a car that suffers with clogged up intake ports, then it's probably better for you to think about which car you are driving. But life isn't that simple, and we don't always do what we recommend. And this is a prime example. This car suffers with clogged intake ports. And every 60,000 miles, I pay 400 pounds to have them cleaned and to keep it in tip top condition, which works out about 0 0.6 pence per mile. And for me, that's worth it instead of thinking about getting a different car. It's not like if I didn't do it at 60,000 miles, there would be a major issue. I've let it go 95,000 miles on one occasion. It's currently got just under 214,000 miles on it. And when I let it go 95,000 miles, it was down on power. It was 120 horsepower instead of 140. And it was down on torque. It was 250 newton meters of torque instead of 300. So there was a noticeable difference in power and there was a very slight hiccup from the engine here and there on cold start during warm-up every so often you get a very slight hiccup not a full-on misfire it was subtle and on very hot days you'd feel the odd subtle hiccup as well but it did still work but that's what i'm doing at the moment that may change in the future and what you do is entirely up to you well, if you found the video interesting, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're looking for car insurance, check out the links to Collingwood and Confused in the description. If you're learning to drive and want to insure yourself on somebody else's car, then Collingwood are there for you because you can do so without affecting the owner's policy of that car that you're using to practice your driving in. And via the link at the moment, there's up to 35% off and a £20 gift card. If you want to insure your own car, I recommend checking out the link to confuse.com because you fill out one quote form and get loads of quotes back from many insurers. So it's a quick and easy way to compare how much it costs to insure different cars. You don't have to do loads of different quotes of all the different cars. You do one quote and just change the car and recalculate to see how much it costs. Using the links doesn't cost you anything, but it does support the channel. So thank you very much. Subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.